Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to the No Miki Show. I think this is on. I think we're doing this right now. Uh, I am your host, not No Miki Konst. Uh, I am Francesca Fiorentini. No Miki is out for the day, and she has so generously and graciously given me the reins of her awesome show. And we have such a good one today. Um, we're talking about the DNC. This is day four. We're going to talk about day three. I'm going to be joined by some awesome guests, um, Jim Zogby, uh, uh, Harvey K, Megan Day, Jane Kleb. We're getting into it. We're talking about where the progressive movement of the Democratic Party goes, given the overwhelming times that we've heard the name Joe Biden. And wow, what a comeback kid. He really, he did it. Um, make sure that you are registered to vote. I'm just going to say that right now, okay? Uh, there's 75 days until the election. You know what to do. Uh, get up on it. You get your mail-in ballot. Do all the things. Um, and also remember to like and subscribe to this show right here, The No Miki Show. Like it. Subscribe. Uh, ring that little bell so you get a notification every time we go live on YouTube. I'm saying we already. This is my first time hosting. It's a we. It's a we. Um... <laughs> I'm just going to jump into my initial thoughts um, on day three of the DNC, and a lot happened last night. Um, Vice presidential nomination or nominee uh, Kamala Harris, I'm going to get this right, Kamala Harris spoke. She talked a lot about family, lots lots and lots about family, and said some really powerful things. One thing was uh, there is no vaccine for racism, which I thought that was a very good point, especially when a lot of people are treating her like a vaccine for racism. And we know that's not true. So it's going to take a lot more than just uh, the first black female vice president. Um, Elizabeth Warren spoke also, um, and she talked a lot about child care. And she had a BLM block letter spelled out strategically behind her in the classroom that she was in. Tight. We saw that. Didn't miss that. Um, Billie Eilish performed and, and now people over 18 know who Billie Eilish is and people under 18 can't vote. So I don't, I, I think I get it. <laughs> it's basically for people's kids to tell them to vote. Um, Hillary Clinton also spoke and just reminded us that she's there. She's there. She's square. She don't care. Uh, she... She's triggering. I'm just going to be real. I think she's triggering no matter where you stand. If you're a moderate, if you're a progressive, you're a lefty, you hate her, love her. She's just a triggering figure at this point. Um, but she's still there reminding everyone to vote once again, once again. Um, it's interesting, though. Everyone's got their take on the DNC, and you really can't say anything positive or critical of anyone without someone telling you that you're either splitting the party or you're a warmonger. So... Uh, there's that. Uh, it's hard to comment on that, you know, but I personally will say that it is nice to have seen party leaders who can form full sentences. Um, and I'm glad Obama did that. I'm glad that he finally criticized Trump. He had some strong words. Um, he said he had that that uh, Trump had no interest in putting in any work no interest in finding common ground, no interest in helping anyone but himself and his friends, no interest in treating the presidency as anything but one more reality show that he can use to get attention that he craves. That's very true. That's very true, Obama. Um, thank you for saying that. Four years in. That's great. We could have used some of that before, but um, there were also like really powerful segments. Uh, some of the topics that were touched on last night uh, were immigration and gun violence. Uh, there was a single mother who spoke about crossing the border into the United States um, with her disabled one-year-old daughter and sort of everything that she had to do to give her daughter a fighting chance. Her daughter is a dreamer. Her second daughter um, is is a U.S. citizen. And, and that was very moving, as was um, Gabby Giffords, a uh, former congresswoman who was shot point blank in the head, who spoke strongly about gun control finally like I'm, I'm it's just incredible to me that we don't talk about Gabrielle Giffords every single day of our lives like uh you know if she were a Republican 
just how much they would talk about her every single day they would talk about her remember how sarah palin put a target over her office anyway just old stuff um there was a lot uh to be made about joe biden's record when it comes to um signing the violence against women act uh that was there was a big deal made of that and yeah that's very true um also conveniently skipping over him grilling anita hill and kind of looking like a POS doing it. But look, there was, you know, two steps forward, one step back. It's like the one thing that's in his record that you can hold up, if anything. So it makes sense that the DNC held it up. Um, then there was the Trump administration. I don't know if you guys caught any of the uh, Trump tweets, all caps, lots of trolling being done by him. Also, uh, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, uh, he was also trolling the DNC last night. He tweeted a gif of Lisa Simpson tearing up a speech when Nancy Pelosi was speaking. And I find that offensive to Lisa Simpson. Okay. Don't, don't link. They're very, very different characters. Let's be real. Get your Lisa Simpson uh, history. Correct. And uh, Biden's middle name is Robinette. That's the most important tidbit to me. And um, we're going to talk about another uh, president, Democratic president, whose middle name was Delano. So look, maybe it's the weird middle names that are going to do it for this party. Maybe we will have a new New Deal in the midst of another economic recession. Uh, I am Francesca Fiorentini, once again, standing in for Nomiki, who is off today. Uh, she deserves the rest. Let's be real. But the coverage cannot end. Um, so thank you for being here. Once again, subscribe and uh, check out the Patreon. Patreon.com. I think it is patreon.com slash the Nomiki show. Support this show. Support it. Because like after this, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be let back on. We are going to take a break and we will be joined by Harvey K to talk about that president with another weird middle name. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Omiki Show. I'm Francesca Fiorentini, your guest host. We're talking about the DNC day three slash four. We're talking about the similarities uh, and differences between this convention and conventions in the past, the future of the progressive movement within the Democratic Party, that inside outside strategy, that push, that pull. And I'm so glad that we have just the guy to talk to us and historicize the moment we're living in, uh, Professor Harvey K. Uh, professor at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, author, AFT union member. Harvey K is, uh, has written 16 books. Oh my, six, really? That's a, a, okay. Including Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, the fight for the four freedoms, take hold of our history, make America radical again, FDR on democracy and the American radical among others. Please welcome Harvey K. How are you? I'm okay. Can you hear me all right? You sound great. Good. You sound perfect. Thank you. It was the least I could do is just have good audio for, and by for the way, this I'll just guest check hosting. I've written nine and I've edited eight, so it's not like I'm... Thank I'm you. Not, that's like, yeah, that's like being the mother of 16 <laughs> kids, but like technically eight are, you know, your stepkids. It so right. it's, makes a lot more sense, Harvey. Um, you're like, I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, not to call you a legend or call you old, but you have been in the movement a long time. And um, you particularly, um, I know, have written a lot about FDR. And I think people are drawing a lot of parallels between FDR and the current president or the current, you know, uh, 
presidential race, especially because Biden has said he wants to be the most progressive president since FDR, um, which I think originally Bernie was supposed to do that. But I think a lot of people are curious, you know, FDR did win in a landslide, 1932, midst of a Great Depression, beat um, Hoover, and then in- immediately got to work on a new deal. Um, did he campaign on that new deal? And what was what was his campaign like? What did that look like? Okay, well, most historians will tell you that he did not campaign early on on a new deal. But I can tell you that if you go back and look through his speeches and the kinds of things he was talking about, he clearly was already moving towards some kind of dramatic new deal. I, I'd even say possibly radical new deal because he spoke along the way of addressing the environment. He talked along the way of creating what he then originally called old age pensions for all Americans. He talked about making sure that the rights of workers were not trampled upon. I mean, he was talking in the kinds of ways that we heard Bernie speaking of and and ready to go beyond. And and the other thing is, is that when he went to the convention, he was intent upon breaking tradition. And I'll just leave it at one thing. He actually attended the convention. And prior to that, candidates did not, especially the nominee did not attend the convention. And then he added to the originality, he flew in in 1932 from New York to Chicago, which showed that maybe it was to show that in spite of his having been wheelchair bound, this was a vibrant, dynamic guy. Right. With a lot of money, because he did have a lot of personal wealth. Yes. He was not um, one of the billionaires, okay. but he had a lot of personal wealth. So this is an interesting question because I think a lot of people on the left are saying, it, unless Biden says yes to a Green New Deal on the campaign trail, then we're not going to get that. But are wh- what do you make of that? Do you think it's possible that even sort of hinting at things like a Green New Deal, um, but not necessarily signing on on that now, could mean that he could be pushed even farther to the left and actually make good on these promises? You you know, I had a week, two weeks ago, I was starting to feel confident about the possibility of pushing Biden to the left. Mm -hmm. But the news that's emerging and, and rather overshadowed, especially in the mainstream media, which is just literally ignoring the signals, Um, If one reads David Sirota's daily newsletter and things like that, one realizes that there's already been sort of a retreat from from the fossil fuels question. There's already been one of Biden's chief aides saying that they may have to, I'll use the I'll use the A word and I don't mean adultery, the austerity word. Okay, so there's already signals that even as they're celebrating the personal character, I mean, I'll just sidebar this and say, I'm not one of the people who's been very excited about this convention. And I say that not just as a leftist, I say that as somebody who wonders, do the Democrats really want to win? Okay. Yep. So I think the thing about Green New Deal and everything else, that we ought not to trust the program that's been in development, but pay very close attention to what he says tonight. Because what he says tonight are the grounds upon which we might be able to hold him accountable and try to push him in that direction. Right. Okay, good. Well, now I have to watch and take notes. Um, (laughs) I mean, I think that's really interesting uh, that, you know, we are not necessarily in that time where an FDR can rise because as bad as things have gotten, they're not necessarily as bad as they were in 1932. Uh, what do you yeah, mean? I mean, it, it, well, yes and no. And let me put it this way. I actually see us in the midst of a crisis that's comparable to the American Revolution, the Civil War, and yes, the, the 1930s. And I, the reason I say that, and I've been making, I've been arguing this for years, basically, is that we've seen 45 years of class war on working people, on women's rights, and on the rights to vote, especially directed at people of color, but I also want to make it clear, also directed at the ability of young people, students to vote. Yes. I mean, the Republicans are and, and, and big business and neoliberals, out of the ranks of which Joe Biden emerges, they have either been directly engaged in or they have been complicit in 
a class war. That's the harshest but most honest way I can put it. So we're in the midst of a crisis. Our inequality is as bad as it was ever. We have massive unemployment. I don't need to review all the things sure. we, about that. But, but I, I, I have to say that I constantly, as I, I'm watching this show, and they're really, they're just push. first of all, they're pushing the personal notes over and over again. And I wasn't originally planning on watching all this, but as people have said, let's talk, I felt obliged to watch it all the way through. I actually fell asleep last night watching the Obama part of the speech. So I went back to rewatch it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, no, but it is the case that, uh, that so far I'm, I'm not becoming more confident. I'm becoming less confident about yeah. what the Democrats want to do. Yeah, you, you touched on two things, which is you don't know if they actually want to win, which I think... Um, a lot of progressives feel the same way, which is, you know, decency died a long time ago. And you, we can see that. And the American people, um, the racists, the xenophobes have been willing to put aside decency for their white identity politics, for the um, plutocrats, for the moneyed entrants for a long time. So you, you we're still riding this decency horse um, and trying to win on that, trying to win on, well, we have empathy and we have a good person. And I got to say, as just like a human being who feels that is attractive to me, a hundred, almost 200,000 deaths into this coronavirus, you know, uh, with c rampant corruption. Yeah. Um, so even, by the way, even as my, my anger or cynicism rises, I get teary eyed. Sure. It's sure. Like, I mean, it's filled with contradictions, this to watch this convention. Sorry. Yeah, you watch Michelle Obama and you're like, who's playing music in the background? Is there, <laughs> is there a set? Okay, no, it's in my head. Like, you know, it's just, they're, right. they're, I mean, they're incredible orators. You have to give it. And, and, and that means a lot. It, of course, it goes a long way, but we know to look beyond that. I mean, I definitely think that if Biden loses, it will be the absolute death of decency. It's like, this is the point is that people want fighters. They want to talk about real issues because they're getting faced with them every single day. Um, what do you make of this idea that Biden wants to be as progressive as FDR? Is that just coming out of one side of his face? Like what, is he responding to the movement, the, you know, the left on that? He said that in the wake of meetings with Bernie. Mm-hmm. OK, in the wake of their creation and maybe even the reports starting to emerge that came out of the six, I believe there were six task forces, task forces that included chairs such as AOC on the climate, such yes. as Sarah Nelson on the economy. And yeah. one got the feeling that in conversation with Bernie, that that Biden was starting to see how to make history. But again, I'm really concerned about the kinds of signals that, that we've seen. You know, I, I think it's this. I keep asking myself, and I think this might even have come up yesterday in the conversation you were involved in on, on the show. And the question is, first of all, I, I don't trust Biden. Let me make, be very clear about that. Um, and I'm not crazy about Kamala Harris. But here's the thing. You have to ask yourself, a guy like Biden wants to go down in history. And Harris is as ambitious as anyone in politics. Yes, absolutely. And what will that mean? It will mean that Biden, in some ways, he knows that this is the last hurrah. This, if he wins, this is his chance to go right. down as more than just another Democratic senator. So maybe, just maybe, he's going to sort of surprise people if we can push him, or at least if we can haunt his imagination. Yes, right? or Bernie should be haunting his imagination, okay? Bernie should be the Biden whisperer, perhaps, right? But then, and here's the other thing. Harris, I actually think that she's capable of really surprising us. I mean, we, we know her record. I, I'm, not, I'm not fantasizing, but it no. is the case that we've seen along the way, she originally came out for Medicare for All and then backed off. Once she's in the vice presidency, if she wants to become president, and avoid a return to uh, an election in which the likes of a Trump beat her or whoever the Democrat is, she's going to have to start taking a lead on progressive things. Now, the DNC has not afforded anyone an opportunity to do that because they're playing the card that they can appeal to Republicans. Yes. That, that, that doesn't give me a lot of confidence in them, but it's also the case 
that we're facing Labor Day. It's now Biden's turn tonight. Let's 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 hope. You know, I what, sorry. That, I, that I prompter's working. What, what's that? That the prompter's working. Yeah, I mean, I asked myself as I watched this, just for the record, okay? I went back and I reread FDR's acceptance speech. Yeah. And I, and I hear, can I give you a, a scenario, a possible fantasy scenario here? Please, okay. please, something to take. I'm, I'm in California, it's on fire, give me anything. Okay, so there were three key elements in FDR's acceptance, first acceptance speech in 1932, July 32. The first one was an emphasis on work and economic security for working people, right? And that really became central to the New Deal. And I'm thinking, what if, what if Biden surprises and talks about not only job creation, but how about a federal job guarantee? So he yes. never returned to this. That's the, okay, so if he, if he wants to take off from FDR. The second thing is FDR announced an end to prohibition in 1932. That was going to be high on his agenda, the 18th Amendment. Legalize weed. There you go. Okay. <laughs> and that would be a very appealing thing. Well, to, to a lot of people, let's put it that way. Okay. Sure. Third, and I think this is really crucial, is that FDR decided, he announced basically that all the old rules had to be thrown out, that government had a significant role in economic progress and economic development. He actually said, I, I, I don't want to look in the book to cheat, but he actually said to, and this is, this is national broadcast, economic laws are not made by nature. They are made by human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted you to know how radical that is. That's like going back to Thomas Paine and the idea that we have it in our power to begin the world over again, or to Karl Marx himself. That's how yeah. radical it no, is. No, for sure. To say okay. that capitalism isn't the air that we breathe. Yes. So here's a thought. How about Stephanie Kelton modern monetary theory being deeper in his in his thoughts? Yes, than, Biden than whispered realized, into his ear. Right. And, and and despite the claims of his chief sort of Senate assistant or whatever the guy's title is that we're going to face austerity, he realizes that we have it in our power to really rev up the economic engine by literally spending the three trillion he's talked about. Yeah. So that's the, that look for those things tonight. The FDR echoes would be work and security, mm. repeal, okay? And last but not least, and maybe the most critical in the, given the situation we face, is the idea that we're going to go big and we're going to go bold and we're never going to go back. Yeah. There's a lot of wishful thinking. Uh, Harvey, I wish you were behind Biden telling him to say those three things, if only to give a little ray of hope on all of this. I think you make such good points. I was just going to say that um, where I get scared is if, if elected, if Biden and Kamala treat Republicans in the Senate and Congress the same way they're treating Republican potential Republican voters. I get appealing to voters. They're going to elect you or not. You can win them over. I know I hate it. I don't I don't want like, you know, I don't care about this sort of like mythical swing voter that everyone's after. I don't understand that. I think we need to build the base of working class, black and brown people, immigrants, etc. But I understand that. The problem I have is once in office to sort of wallpaper over all of the rifts and the disagreements in the service of bipartisanship, which we know is BS. And we know that Republicans never do that. And Republicans will be trying to undermine you at every step. And Kamala's gotten firsthand front seat, uh, front row seats to that. I mean, the Kavanaugh hearing, all of this. So like she can see and has seen the bad faith in which the GOP operates. And I hope Biden, if elected, also operates under that same assumption. That's where I get scared, you know, yeah, with not, the pandering not, not to, to the middle. Us, not, to, not to depress us again. The one person <laughs> who actually could have transcended the divide, and I say that with, look, I confess to having been solidly with Bernie probably since the 1980s. But here's the thing, <laughs> this is the thing. Bernie could have transcended the divide and appealed to those folks. I'm in Wisconsin. Mm. Trump won Wisconsin. But I can't tell you how many of my 18-year-old students told me that their parents were, would have been very happy to vote for Bernie 
they would not have been happy to ever vote for a Clinton again. Sure. In other words, meaning Bill Clinton's legacy. So I'm thinking, so here in this instance, all well and good. Let's try to bring in Republican voters, but you're not going to bring them in with John Kasich. They're appealing to the wrong Republican voters. They're not appealing to urban and rural working class folks who want to know, they want to know, are you still the Biden of NAFTA? Are you still the Biden of the TPP? I mean, people... By the way, I'm not, I, don't, I don't think Wisconsin voters who went to Trump voted on race at all. I think they were played maybe with, with the economic legacy of the Clinton and Obama years. And they figured they heard, they heard things said by Trump that promised a reversal of these yes. unfair trade agreements and so on. What is Biden going to do to talk to them? They're the ones who may well, I'm not talking about the hardcore Trump folks who marched, you know, to, to bring it into Wisconsin is wearing masks, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the folks who seriously are worried about how to secure enough money to take care of their families, to take care of their families as their kids get older and go off to college. I mean, just like yeah. the rest of us, right? Yeah, their, their deal with the devil was being okay with the racism, which I yes. think people have different opinions about, uh, I, you know, how excusable that is. But it, you're absolutely right that those voters are still gettable as, you know, sort of uh, as much as they excuse Trump's Yeah, and I did one other behavior. thing that quickly. African-Americans didn't turn out in the same way either in 2016 here in Wisconsin, because they're working class too. Right. And what did Hillary, what did Hillary say all the way along against Bernie? She was saying, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't afford that. There was no reason to believe that the Democrats were going to do what needed doing. But in the case, perhaps, of of African-Americans, they weren't going to switch their allegiance to Trump in any way. They just weren't going to turn out it with the enthusiasm they would have in the past. Right. And now, I mean, I think this is, and a lot has been said about the Bernie campaign, but I do think that some of the glad handing in the South Bernie was not able to do. Right. Um, some of the sort of the, the key things that a lot of black voters and not, not working class and not Bernie supporters. Cause we know that, that, you know, that like the African-American vote below the age of 30 was strongly with Bernie. Yes. Um, but for those, that core base of older voters, they weren't seeing what they needed to see from Bernie and he wasn't making the right connections to whether it's religious leaders, um, obviously Clyburn, you know, I, I think one yeah. part, and this is, this is, we're getting into it, but like, you know, one thing that I was striking to me is that Bernie never even asked Clyburn. Now I know Clyburn, of course, cause he probably knew Clyburn was on board with Biden from the jump, but you gotta ask, you know, you know, maybe make, make a, you know, make your pitch. That being said, as we talked about yesterday, the uh, the 72 hour coalescing around Biden that happened. I mean, these centrists fell left and right faster. I mean, it could make your head spin. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Warren still spoke last <laughs> night at the DNC. Also another, uh, I would say, triggering figure if you're a progressive. And then um, once again, a whole can of worms. Um, all right. So we're looking out for discussing of job guarantees legalizing weed which i don't think he's gonna do mr like anti-rave uh crime bill biden but you never know and then and then it's the question of going bold in terms of really transforming america going big and going bold harvey uh my fingers are crossed thank you so much for joining me on the no miki show no miki sends her best um Everyone follow Harvey K on the socials. Uh, we'll see if his his sunniest prediction comes true. And if not, we're going to need you for the long haul, my friend. Take care. Okay. I hope to see you again sometime. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Bye-bye. And thank you all for watching. Thank you for being here. Make sure to subscribe and like and all the things. I'm your stand-in host. We will be right back with this incredible panel. Uh, Jim Zogby, Megan Day, Jane Kleb. We're getting into it. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to the No Me Key Show. I am not No Me Key. I am Francesca. I am your guest host. Uh, thank you for being here. We're talking about the DNC. It is day four. We're looking back at day three. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the future of the progressive movement uh, in this giant party, this big tent that is trying to smoke us out of it time and time and time again. Uh, I am joined for the rest of the show by three panelists, three guests, uh, Dr. Jim Zogby, founder of the American Arab, Arab American Institute, managing director of Zogby Research, fellow and former chair of the Sanders Institute and longtime DNC member. Jim, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and Megan Day, staff writer for Jacobin. Um, her articles have been in the New York Times, The Guardian, Vox, N Plus One, The Baffler, In These Times, and Mother Jones. And she recently co-authored Bigger Than Bernie, How We Go From the Sanders Campaign to Democratic Socialism with Micah Utrecht. Thank you so much for being here, Megan. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. And finally, Jane Kleb, chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party and founder of Bold Nebraska, also the author of Harvest the Vote, talking all about um, Democ the Democratic Party in rural America and how we're probably missing the boat on that. Um, and uh, she is also uh, an organizer. She organized against the Keystone XL pipeline and is the treasurer of our revolution. Jane, welcome. Hello. Thank you all for being here. Um, let's let's talk about everything, but what, but one by one, Dr. Zogby, starting with you, uh, you have uh, seen movements come and go in, inside, outside, inside electoral politics, outside of them. You were part of the Rainbow Coalition and were close to Jesse Jackson's uh, bid for the presidency in the 80s. What is your assessment now of where we are in the year 2020 um, and the ways that the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party is inching out again the progressive wing? Well, they can try, but they can't succeed. And frankly, we're stronger today than we have ever been. Um, look, just, just a couple of little examples. I've been on the DNC for almost three decades. Uh, when we had an election for chair in 2017, it was the first time we ever had an actual election for chair, number one. Number two, <laughs> we had a vote on the floor, a contested vote on the floor, on whether or not to ban corporate PAC money first time we ever had a contested vote and debate on the floor. And every DNC meeting since then, we have had a contested vote on the floor. The progressive movement within the party is stronger than it has ever been before. And it's going to be stronger after this election if, and I believe, those who are elected uh, as delegate, as progressives, decide to sink their, their roots into the ground of the state where they come from and get themselves elected to party posts. What was different in the Jackson campaign was that it came and it went, and it certainly did succeed in increasing voter registration in the black community, which was Jesse's strategy. I mean, after that, remember in 86, we won across the South and we yeah. turned the Senate Democratic and it was Jackson's vote that did it. And then in the years that followed, we elected mayors in big cities in the Northeast and Midwest. We elected the governor of Virginia Dave Dinkins ran for mayor and won in New York City. That all was Jesse's thing. But what didn't happen was that we didn't change the party. This progressive movement is con committed to changing the party. And so far, I see real progress that we've made. We don't win in a night. You don't win in a year. But frankly, we're, are we better off than we were four years ago? Absolutely. And are we getting stronger? Yes, I believe so. So don't give up on the DNC is what you're saying. Well, there really isn't an alternative. And frankly, those who say, let's form another party um, are literally handing the party over to the establishment, which is, Jesse taught me one lesson way back when I got so frustrated on the Arab baiting and people trying to keep me out. And I said, I'm going to quit. And he said, if you quit, you give them what they want. What they fear most is that you'll get mad and stick around and fight. That is my mm -hmm. motto. It's what I've lived with all these years. And it is what my advice would be to young folks in the progressive movement. If you quit and try to start something new, you give them just what they want, stick around and fight. That's what they fear most. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I've only been in this movement since like the Iraq war and I'm already feeling like I got to give lessons to some younger folks, you know, uh, but hey, I don't have that, the length of history. Um, 
Megan, speaking to that about not giving up on a party that really feels like it wants to just, you know, uh, flush you out like a bad virus, <laughs> like what you wrote, you know, um, where basically a book about where the movement uh, that helped Bernie, um, you know, come within striking distance of the Democratic nomination for president, where that movement goes now. What do you what do you think is happening with that movement currently? And what do you see for the future? Well, I agree that we are on better footing than we've been in living memory. Um, by we, I guess I mean this sort of like very broad progressive movement, which also includes democratic socialists. And it includes people who um, feel a little bit less sanguine about the potential of the Democratic Party to ultimately deliver um, the kind of, you know, actual commitment to working class people. And it also includes people who want to and believe that we're within striking distance of realigning the Democratic Party, but from poll to poll, that entire movement is actually on much better footing, and those are legitimate questions for us to be hashing out. And finally, we have enough people who can see each other that we can actually start to have those conversations. I tend to fall on the side of thinking that um, eventually, in order to make the change that we know that we really need, we're going to have to have some kind of independent party that is independent from the capitalist class and that is committed on paper to fighting for the interests of the working class contra the diametrically opposed interests of the capitalist class. But mm -hmm. I agree that this is not happening tomorrow and it's not happening the next day. And that if you take your ball and go home in anger, then you're not acting out of strategy. And that is probably giving, um, you know, people who've been might, mighty irritated by our rise for um, the last five years, giving them precisely what they want. We're a thorn in their side and they would love nothing more than to see us disappear into the night. Um, so I think we have to be extremely strategic about it while also holding out um, holding out the, the possibility that a cross-class coalition, which is fundamentally what the Democratic Party is, is not going to be the vehicle for uh, transformative change for the working class in a sort of distant horizon. But yeah, you got to be strategic mm. about it. And I'm excited that we're all here capable of being strategic together, you know, whereas before a lot of us were completely depoliticized, apolitical, lost in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Jane, what is, what's your response to that? I mean, you, you know, specifically work with and write about <laughs> rural voters who have been also cast aside, um, you know, no matter where they stand sort of on the spectrum politically, but also misrepresented as perhaps being less progressive than they are. Yeah. What are your thoughts? So, you know, I think as progressives, we have to take the same strategies that we have used in the streets to mobilize unlikely alliances on issues from racial justice to climate change to gun violence to healthcare. Use those same skills and strategies and creativity and bring that into partisan politics. I think partisan politics for too long has been seen as a dirty place and a dirty word that as progressives, we're gonna be above the fray and work on these issues instead. But the reality is we're not gonna get the party infrastructure, which is critical to recruit candidates uh, that look and sound like our communities and deeply care about the issues we care about. Uh, we're not gonna get the rules and platform that govern how our party operates unless there's more of us inside the party. And we're not gonna be able to actually pass legislation once we elect all these candidates uh, that really reflects our progressive value. So. The only way that we can do that is us being both in the streets, like I definitely want us still in the streets, but we also have to be inside the party, running for party positions, and it's complicated and they like to keep it complicated because then it means that we get frustrated and we just say, well, that's just a bunch of, you know, insiders and party establishment and I'm not going to be part of it. Like Jim, Dr. Sogby and I are establishment, right? We are part of the establishment. And I want more people as part of the party establishment so we can continue to transform the party. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you just have to, you have to just demand a hug. You just have to come on, get it. I don't know. I'm, I'm like trying to think of like what it is. You gotta, uh, anyway, but I, I, I am curious because last night, former President Obama spoke. Mm -hmm. Uh, once again, I will say it was nice to see someone who could finish a sentence, who could emote, who could sort of meet the country where it's at. I mean, let's be real. The majority of the country is feeling pretty left out to dry right now. And it was nice to have that leadership. Little late is what I was saying earlier. Um, but I think it's been pointed out and it, it, it bears 
pointing out again that when Obama was elected, so much of the grassroots movement that helped him win, he cut them out from underneath them, that he turned his back on them, was like, thanks, got it from here. I'm just going to fill this cabinet with a bunch of old positions. Um, now we ha don't have the amount of excitement for Biden, but behind the scenes, there are lots of movement and grassroots um, organizations pushing him. I don't know where, Dr. Zogby, where do you see, if elected, Biden, how do you see him treating that movement? Well, look, let's understand with Obama that there were some unique circumstances here. I mean, uh, from within, literally a few days after he was elected, he met with the Senate and House leadership. And O'Connell um, and Paul Ryan made it very clear to him, you're a one-term president and we're going to oppose everything you do. Yeah. And given the rules of the Senate, they were able to block a whole hell of a lot. Would I have loved to see much more progressive legislation? Absolutely. But where Jane is right is that you can have aspirational politics, but real politics is something different. My one regret about uh, Barack Obama was that there wasn't enough Lyndon Johnson in him. Uh, I would have loved to have seen him on the phone. Uh, I don't know if I can say this, on, but Lyndon Johnson would say, I'm going to cut your balls off. I mean, what he said literally to folks that yeah. he was dealing with in the Senate. And if they if they bothered him and if they didn't come along with civil rights legislation they wanted to pass or other social programs, he did just that. Um, that ability to move Congress with the power of the pulpit of the presidency, Barack Obama didn't do that. I mean, he waited and waited and waited, and then he'd give the great speech, assuming that that would change things. But the great speech, absent the sinking your your teeth into the members of Congress, didn't happen. At the same time. The Republican Party um, created the birther movement and the Tea Party, and they fed off of race um, and the anger of the white middle class that was being ignored and had been ignored um, and created this beast that first devoured them and is now devouring us. And so the challenges are much different. How will uh, Joe Biden respond? I think Joe Biden won't have a choice how to respond. He will have to number one, engage in real politics. And I think he does that. Um, and I think Kamala Harris is also a fighter and will engage in real politics. But I also think the movement that brought him to the White House will play a critical role in the, in the next couple of years. Number one, I think we're gonna have a very different Congress. We're gonna have a very different Senate and we're gonna have a very different mass movement. The White House is gonna have to respond to that. And I feel confident that we have the capacity to do that. I mean, we have to know our strength and our strength is legion we have to now actualize that strength the same power we bring uh to changing the party to changing the politics on so many issues the issues that jane talked about we will use to change legislation and to change how the white house reacts i'm seeing and on issues i never thought i'd see movement on and mm -hmm. uh frankly platform didn't go far enough but the fact that we pushed it as far as we did and have the capacity to push it more i thought bernie and aoc gave remarkably astute observations about what the agenda is and how we will use this platform of winning the White House to move that agenda forward. Uh, to me, it's yes. a roadmap for going forward. M Megan, what's, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think I'm, I'm um, a little less optimistic about Joe Biden himself leading the charge as president or Kamala Harris. And by, I mean, I'm sure they'll lead the charge on various things, but I don't imagine that they're going to to be um, fighting for the kinds of changes that that we want, that we've already had to push um, the you know centrist wing of the Democratic Party to um, budge and accommodate. Um, you know, there's ev there's evidence of this already. I mean, who's to say? But for one thing, I mean, I think that I, I just I think that Joe Biden himself um, is. Is, has never demonstrated uh, a faithful commitment to working class issues per se. That is, as I said before, contra the interests of the capitalist class. He's sort of a typical third way Democrat who seeks compromise between these two classes, which tends to favor, of course, the dominant class, which has the you know nickname the dominant class for a reason, dominates. Um, so I, I, I don't feel super... Um, 
I guess I don't feel super optimistic that Joe Biden's going to lead the charge on this. And I also think that, you know, you're starting to see signs like, for example, one of his confidants, Ted Kaufman, did just say that, you know, when we get in, the pantry is going to be bare, um, meaning that Trump mm-hmm. is going to have run up a deficit and they're going to have to sort of impose austerity. I mean, I do think that you, you're seeing people in the Biden camp start to lay the groundwork for actually, um, you know, running a really, a really run of the mill, really centrist um administration that's probably going to be, um, you know, austerity and and privatization focused like many before it. Um, So no, I don't feel like super enthusiastic about Joe Biden leading the charge. Um, Mm. That said, do I want him to win? Absolutely. Are you kidding? Of course. Um, And and furthermore, I don't think that it's completely hopeless because I do think that the movement piece is important. And I think that obviously we can see a Joe Biden presidency responding to movement pressure in a way that was not possible for a Trump presidency. And we have a movement that actually um, has some legs to it and and some teeth. Um, And I think that the purpose of, you know, extra parliamentary organizing of all kinds is really to create political crises that people are forced to respond to regardless of their own political inclinations. And so for that reason, my lack of optimism about Joe Biden doesn't actually contravene my lack of optimism about where the movement is headed. Like, I still feel like we actually have a pretty decent shot to um, to make to make our mark. But I don't think that we should take for granted that Joe Biden and certainly not Kamala Harris, but I won't go into it, are going to be allies necessarily in that fight. Jane, I wanted to get your response, but also if you can weave in um, Tom Perez, uh, head of the DNC, Mm. is doing away with caucuses. And I just understood what a caucus was this year. (laughs) And I was uh, part of one. I witnessed what happened in Nevada. And I was like, oh, my God, nobody knows what they're doing. But I wanted to get your thoughts on on that move. Yeah. In addition to this. Yep. Yep. So first, I think it's it's important to remember and like put President Obama's presidency in context with Dr. Zogby did. Um, and I just want to build on that, you know, Obama ran as an outsider. I think it's really important to remember that the party establishment actually hated President Obama. Oh, yeah. Um, and they didn't want him to win the primary. They wanted Secretary Clinton to win that primary. And so he came into his position of being president thinking that the party structure was not worth saving. And so instead, they created this whole outside, you know, infrastructure called Organizing for America to go after, you know, the same name of his campaign, OFA, and put a lot of financial resources into that. And the problem with that was that it was only structured around lifting up the issues that the White House was pushing. It was not an organization or a grassroots movement that was lifting up the issues that people were talking about. So that's critical because he starved state parties of money, which meant we lost 1,200 state legislative governor in uh, House and Senate races uh, during the Obama administration, even though we won two years in the White House and we did amazing work. And I love President Obama, so I don't want to make, you know, have any mistakes about that or have somebody from Center for American Progress yelling at me on Twitter. So I just want to make that clear. (laughs) So, uh, but what he didn't do was fund the infrastructure that then makes the makes the work happen to get people to go for the polls and for us to organize on issues. So that's really important. But what the movement showed during the Obama administration was that when you put public pressure on the administration in the streets, they do listen to people. That was true for two particular issues from my perspective, don't ask, don't tell. Uh, when gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender members of the military were chaining themselves to the White House. It eventually forced President Obama to come to terms with that issue. And then Keystone XL. You know, Keystone XL would have been a done deal if the environmental group stayed in the box of only lobbying members of Congress. We would have lost. Mm-hmm. Instead, people on the front lines of where the pipeline was going to be most impacted, that was farmers, ranchers, and tribes, we worked hand in hand with the environmental groups to say that playbook is not going to work. Like we have to be in the cornfields, in the streets and in the halls of Congress in order to put pressure on President Obama. So I think as movement people, we have to do that same thing when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are in the White House. We need to keep on pushing. Um, And I think that they expect that and they should welcome that. And if they don't, we should be the ones telling them that that's the only way that you'll get reelected four years from now. So that's one. On the caucuses, first, I was shocked when I heard Chair Perez say that he was going to do away with the caucuses, and he can't just snap his fingers and do away with it. There's a whole rules process that has to happen. Um, So 
I do think that a lot of discussion happen needs to happen around the caucuses. I was on the Unity Reform Commission. Dr. Zogby was on it. Uh, Nomiki was no on the Reform Commission. Yeah. So, you know, we really did put a lot of reforms in place to make caucuses more accessible, more open, more transparent, because there were some issues. And there still are issues. You know, it's very difficult for state parties who have very limited resources to then run a government function. You're essentially telling state parties and literally thousands of volunteers across states that you have to run an election. And that's a lot of responsibility. So, you know, does the you know party infrastructure decide maybe we do caucuses on endorsements of candidates? Because that's really how Paul Wellstone, for example, in Minnesota, he would have never been a senator without the caucus structure of endorsements that the Minnesota Democratic Party has. There's a place for caucuses. Whether or not they should be our presidential primary uh, process is, I think, a question mark that deserves a lot of dialogue with state parties as well as with voters. Yeah, let we're me, just not just giving say, um, a, an app the ability to run your caucus. There's also that. Go ahead, Dr. Zogby. I just want to add one thing. I wasn't suggesting that Joe Biden would lead the charge as much as Joe Biden will follow the charge yeah. of the movement that will lead it. And what he does have um, is the capacity, once that happens, to legislate and to push legislators saying, in effect, I got to have this, guys, because we can't move without it. Um, the movement will not give up. I mean, I can see Black Lives Matter demonstrations in the streets outside the White House. I mean, my office actually happens to be on Black Lives Matter Boulevard. Um, my window overlooks the A and the L. Um, uh, and uh, and I think it's real. Uh, it, that movement's not going away. Neither are many of the other movements that have emerged. Um, yeah. Joe Biden will have to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And he has the capacity to respond to it. In a way, I think, as Jane said, in a way that President Obama didn't have the capacity, partly because um, he he uh, he was facing way too many other challenges um, and a, a really dysfunctional uh, Senate uh, that was blocking, and um, I mean he didn't have the votes to do anything. Uh, yeah. And so when when healthcare was 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 being debated, I mean we kept saying do Medicare for all. I mean it was just so simple. But where do you get the votes to pass Medicare for all in that Senate that you had? Yeah. And so you know. You put Max Baucus in charge and you're going to get what you got. Uh, it was the best deal we could get. But frankly, I think we'll be in a much better position if we win many more Senate seats in this election to really get a more progressive agenda. I wanted to just pull in two things that, you know, Megan and Dr. Zogby, you guys have been saying and, and Megan. And I think it's really important to talk about working class issues and talk about, yeah, what does it mean that, you know, no matter what, you know, the. Joe Biden might stop deportations, but there's no way he's going to rein in tech when it comes to surveilling, because that's money. That's money. There's a capitalist class that's very real. Um, and just get, Dr. Zogby, your thoughts on the Rainbow Coalition. I think that so wrongly, we've seen stripped identity politics of its politics and just seen it as identity and seen it as separate from um, the working class issues. It's either economic anxiety or, you know, racial justice, pick a box, you know, and that's BS. We know that's BS. And having Jesse Jackson at the helm of that ticket in 86, having this rainbow coalition, which if you call it something a rainbow coalition now, I feel like people would be like, ah, it's the United Colors of Benetton, you know, but, but it, it truly was speaking to working class, um, black and brown Americans, uh, black Americans specifically. And I, I just, what are the prospects that we get something like that again, um, that can bridge that stupid divide that separates um, Americans of color and working class Americans, which really are the same base. We saw it with Bernie. Uh, and I think that that consciousness will continue uh, mm -hmm. to grow. There is a Look, I, one of the roles I play in the party is I chair the ethnic council. That's the, basically the white working class in Midwestern and mid-Atlantic states. Um, I had a fight in 2014 with the party pollster who was talking about how, don't, don't be depressed because we got swamped in 2014. He said, we actually kept the Obama coalition together. We won the black vote. We won the Latino vote. We won the, 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 the Asian vote. We won the youth vote. And we won the professional women vote. But we didn't win enough of them. So he said, the lesson is we have to spend more money on that base vote. 
So after enough people went around the room saying, you're great, that was so hopeful and everything, I raised my hand and I said, what about white ethnic voters in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin? Why did we lose them so badly? Mm -hmm. um, he said, I don't know, but he said, we're not going to waste money throwing uh, good money after them. They're never going to vote for us because of race. I fundamentally disagreed. And I saw in the Sanders campaign, that would not be the case. Um, and the reality is that in the 60s and 70s, we focused on race. And that was correct in the party to do that. But it's not either or. It's got to be a comprehensive message that reaches both the white working class and those doubly disadvantaged by economic issues, and that is poor black and brown folk. And I think Bernie had that message, and I think that the movement has that message. I've seen that in our revolution and in DSA and in Justice Democrats. I mean, there is yeah, this man. growing sense in the progressive movement that it's not either or politics. The Democratic Party's got to learn that because in the culture of the Democratic Party today, that consciousness isn't there. They go mm -hmm. for what they think are the easy votes and they ignore why is it that that white working class folks and minors and rural uh, voters have abandoned us why because we abandon them and frankly we have to go to them and bring them back to build the majoritarian coalition that will ultimately transform america i think that consciousness is there and that is if anything the fundamental message we have to carry forward that's great um wrap it around and feel free to respond but this is the sort of the last question um what do we prioritize uh where's our pressure biden is elected inshallah and uh where's the pressure go first hundred days um jane let's Give start with you everybody else i'm done <laughs> well first let me just um Dr. Zogby, everything you're saying, I'm like, amen. Like, I wish we were in the same room. I could hug you and uh, give you I high five. We, we're all just drinking beers at a bar right now. To be honest with you, yes, we Dr. could just Zogby, talk for hours. He'd be smoking a cigar and it would be pretty great. Um, it'd be like the smell of our grandpas. So <laughs> I, I think a couple of things. One, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, when he was um, mobilizing the Rainbow Coalition, it was not just, as you guys already have mentioned, communities of color. He went to the white farmers in the Midwest when the farm crisis was happening. And he had on overalls and rode a tractor and said one of the most important, important speeches, I think, of political times. And the basic was that the eaters and the feeders have to unite for real economic justice. And mm -hmm. That's what we have to do. And that's what Reverend Barber talks about. That's what Senator Sanders talks about. That's what AOC talks about. It's what all of us talk about. And so we have to keep pushing that. One, I think, uh, assuming we win, knock on wood, I think we have to get rid of the filibuster and maybe controversial with some circles, but you know, the Republican Party has totally thrown the rule book out the window. And I want us to uh, govern with our hearts and with compassion and with a fist. So I am with Speaker Pelosi on this. Like you get into the arena, you throw a punch for the children, right? You take a punch and you throw a punch. So <laughs> I want those rules changed. I think we absolutely have to take serious climate action. Not this nonsense about, you know, carbon neutral. No, not carbon neutral. Cause then you'll classify natural gas as carbon neutral and all this other stuff. Like we have to start to peel back the talking points that have been too much in the Democratic Party and I, quite frankly, I think even too much in our current platform and get to the real route that we all know uh, in order to solve climate change, in order to solve economic uh, and racial justice issues and gun violence. Like we know what the solutions are. Let's actually now have the grit to actually get them done. Awesome, Megan. Yeah, I wanna also respond to and, and agree with what Dr. Zogby said. I mean, I think that um, what we don't want, what we know that we don't want is a sort of um, symbolic gesture of politics that stands in for a politics of real transformation for the working class broadly. And obviously working class people of color included in fact disproportionately in that category. Um, we know that we don't wanna just slap a hashtag BLM on it and and move along or like a rainbow flag emoji or, or whatever. Um, but we also know that we, we can't simply um, uh, divert the conversation to economic issues and expect that people are going to automatically come around because like this is the culture that we live in. We live in a very racist, a very sexist, homophobic and divided culture and people naturally are inclined to thinking about how those issues are affecting their lives. And so we 
we need to, if, for those of us who really want to promote a message of economic rights and economic justice, we have to, um, in good faith, engage with and then deepen the messaging of, of those movements that are happening somewhat independently and that have the potential to go either way, whether into yeah. the sort of like symbolic or gestural territory or into territory that, um, you know, works with our actual platform and our actual program. Uh, so for an example, a, a, an example of what we do want that isn't just slap a hashtag BLM on it and move on is we want to say, Defund the police is like one of the most exciting, um, you know, slogans that I've seen arise from the streets in a while because it doesn't simply state the problem, which is that Black lives do not matter. It starts to state a solution, and that solution is actually points toward a large portion of everything that we've been saying for so long. Defund the police. The implicit second part of that is and reinvest in the social services that should have been there all along, for which mass incarceration was a poor and violent substitute. Right. Yes. So defund the the police fund education fund health care fund housing fund social services fund a government that works for all um, and so that i think has to be the path forward is um is uh, not counterposing these things but finding the finding the points where they connect and really emphasizing and deepening those um, as for where our energy needs to be in the first 100 days i mean it's got to be on it's got to be on covid economic relief i mean obviously probably it is going to have to be on continuing to flatten the curve right so there's that um and but in in terms of a a I think we need to try to make an effort to um, articulate the case, which Bernie Sanders is excellent at doing, that the problems that have flourished for working class people in this country throughout the COVID pandemic, the economic problems that have flourished are symptomatic of things that we should have fixed a long time ago, and they should be showing us that we need to fix them now. So I would like to see the progressive movement come out with a strong um, emphasis on uh, addressing the COVID economic crisis by implementing the kinds of policies that should have been there along, whether that's Medicare for all, whether that's you know actual um, housing that is affordable for people, ideally beautiful public housing, social housing, and so on, uh, instead of this you know massive of um, evictions and foreclosures that we're staring staring into the black hole of right now. Um, yes. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome, top cop defund the police. Let's do this, Kamala. <laughs> uh, Dr. Zogby, any last words? Nope, I love the conversation and I hope we continue it. Likewise, I don't know if all of Nomiki's panels are this great, but I feel like I got the best one I and I'm, I'm really tell her happy about you. it. <laughs> it's, it's me, I conjured you all. Um, Jane Klebb, Jim Zogby, Megan Day, follow their work um, and thank you so much for being here. Take good care of yourselves. We need you for this long fight. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Great Thanks work. And that has been the No Me Key Show with Francesca Fiorentini. Follow me at Franny Pio. I have a podcast. It's called The Bituation Room. It's funny, so uh, be warned. I will be trying to make jokes, and that's what I do because uh, I'm also a comic. So if I've gotten anything wrong tonight, today, it's because I'm a comedian. What are you going to do? Uh, you can't teach me nothing. Um, thank you to the entire No Me Key team, and she will be back. Manana. Take good care, y'all, tonight. It's the big kahuna, presidential nominee Joe Biden. Let's do this. Bye.